Great, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Will Nicholson from the Food Foundation. I'm going to be um, taking us through the event today um, as we look through the ideas around launching a coalition to strengthen accountability mechanisms for benchmarking the food industry so that we can understand what, what the industry is doing at a global and a national and regional level. This is an affiliated session, obviously, as part of the United Nations Food System Summit 2021 pre-summit events brought to you by the Food Foundation and the World Benchmarking Alliance, with thanks to our supporters, uh, UK Aid and Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Uh, we've got uh, 50 minutes and a lot of stuff that we want to cover, so I'm going to get stuck straight in, if that's OK. So what we're going to look at this event in the event is describing what a roadmap um, sorry, um, I'm jumped to the agenda. So the agenda, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about what the work that's currently going on in the World Benchmarking Alliance. So we're going to hear from Victoria de Bourbon de Palma, who heads up the food and agriculture benchmark work at the World Benchmarking Alliance. I'm then going to introduce very briefly the national work we've been doing on a food industry benchmark at the Food Foundation through our project Plating Up Progress and how that's aligned with Victoria's team's global work. And then we're going to hear a little bit from some people in the UK who have been collaborating with us and engaging with us on the benchmark. So we're going to hear from Julia Oust from Bid Food UK, which is one of the wholesaler businesses we cover in our UK benchmark. And Sophie Lawrence, who is from Rathbone Green Bank Investments, who again is one of the investors that we engage with in the work. So we want to give a little bit of context of how it's how it's worked successfully and, and what are the areas for improvement in terms of national benchmarking in the UK. Really importantly, the second half of the um, session is going to be looking at the wider national context. So we've got a panel session to look at three different countries. What are the priorities and the challenges and what, what, what might we want to look at if we're going to create a toolkit that can be used in different countries outside of countries like the UK. And then we're gonna close up just with some next steps and talk a little bit about how you can be part of this um, opportunity to change how we benchmark the food industry. Uh, next slide, please, Chloe. Great, so just a bit of background and context for this. Um, using the World Benchmarking Alliance Global Food and Agriculture Benchmark and the Food Foundation's UK Plating Up Progress Benchmark, we're developing a toolkit that will enable other organizations to implement similar methodologies and benchmarks within their own countries. Um, in order to do this properly, what we wanna do is set up a coalition of like-minded organizations to help co-create the toolkit and review it with us. And then next year to start piloting the toolkit in different countries so we can actually make sure it works on the ground. This is an idea that's building on the UN Food System Summit dialogue that we held um, earlier in the year, along with Gain and, and Apney, who I think have, have been able to join us today and are kind of formative members of this, this coalition, if you like. So what, the, what we want the coalition to do is to support through consultation, the development of the toolkit and the appropriate metrics within that for assessing the food industry's role in system transformation so that it can be applied at a national and a global level and capture the, the nuances and the context of, of different countries' challenges, but all within an aligned methodology. Um, and then to review and enhance that methodology and the engagement best practices based on learnings of some pilots that we're looking to do, um, and obviously the coalition, really the other people who would look to pilot the toolkit in other countries in 2022 and, and beyond. Uh, next slide, please, Clay. So our long-term vision is the World Benchmark Alliance has a global benchmark so that they cover an awful lot of businesses working at a global and, and a global level, the biggest of the big in the food industry. And the work that I head up in, in the Food Foundation is looking at the UK. So we're looking at, if you like, the biggest of the big in the UK. And what we envisage is this ability to have um, lots of different benchmarks looking at different countries, all using this aligned methodology so that we're asking the same sort of questions of businesses and we're sharing best practices and sharing outcomes and things like that. So that's where we want to get to. We're, we're taking the baby steps this year, if you like. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Victoria from the World Benchmarking Alliance to talk about their work specifically. 
because uh, that's the global context that we're starting from. Victoria, over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Will, and welcome to everybody. Uh, great to have this session. And uh, just a, a reminder, really, that uh, why are we having this session? Well, it is more and within the UN Food Systems Summit pre-summit, because actually one of the agreed outcomes of the summit is that there will be a monitoring and review mechanism to follow up the pledges and commitments that are made at the summit and also what we, what we are seeing uh, over the last three days. So as Will mentioned, we received very strong support uh, for the food systems dialogue that we held on this topic. And that's very much because benchmarks are an ideal tool to measure and compare company for performances and really to assess whether the commitments that are being made today and yesterday and, and in the coming months, whether they are put into action. And as Will pointed out, so the organizations hosting today, the Food Foundation and, and World Benchmarking Alliance have experience in this field. And we are looking to really build a coalition of actors for a national or regional food systems index and access to nutrition and gain have already agreed to be a part of that. And so today we're really hoping to add many more other organizations to, to build this coalition and, uh, and to work towards better food systems worldwide. On the next slide, I'll give you some more context on the work that we do at the World Benchmarking Alliance. So it's it's very much of a global scope. Uh, so we have global companies in scope and, and very global thematic areas that we focus on. So if you put it into a visual, it's really of an overarching uh, benchmark. Uh, we go, uh, we have the breadth, we go less into the depth as, as other initiatives do. So, for example, the, the Access to Nutrition's Global Index that has been launched last week, last month, uh, goes into much more detail on the level of nutrition, but also has fewer companies in scope. And the Food and Agriculture Benchmark really looks at companies from farm to fork, so the entire food system, really looking at it from a food systems lens, and also thematically looking at nutrition, but also looking very detailed on environment and social issues. On the next slide, uh, you will see that uh, how we've grouped the companies in scope. So we have 350 companies in total in scope, which represent over half of global revenue. They're headquartered in 41 different countries. So we really wanted to have a global representation and, and, and uh, really showcase how these companies have influence and impact worldwide. And they range, as I said, from farm to fork, so from agricultural inputs to traders all the way to food service providers at the, at the end of the chain. The team, as we speak, is very busy to assess these 350 companies, uh, which is a lot of work, but we'll be ready by September along the UN Food System Summit to be launching the first results. And Chloe already showed you a sneak peek of the methodology. So on the next slide, you'll see it's quite of a busy screen, but I wanted to share it with you because these are the 45 topics that we're assessing. So as I mentioned, we look at it very broadly. So we have uh, six topics in nutrition, 12 in environment, and uh, 27 in social inclusion. So it's ranging from greenhouse gas reduction, soil health, water use, and environment, to in nutrition, looking at the availability of healthy foods, the accessibility and affordability, but also looking at food safety, of course, moving beyond just the national re legal requirements, but taking extra steps uh, to ensure that, uh, that there is safe food for everyone. And in the social inclusion bit, really looking at the social aspects of the food system. So uh, looking at human rights due diligence, but very specifically also what companies are doing to eliminate forced labor and child labor in the supply chains. Are they paying or committed to pay living wage and those kinds of, uh, so, and kinds of topics? So finally, on my last slide, you see um, the group of stakeholders that we collectively and, and, and part of the participants today will, will be uh, representing. And, and it's, it's very much important to stress that the work we do is really to empower the stakeholders because we can only achieve the impact if we collaborate and if these stakeholders can take action upon, uh, for example, benchmark results and the data, the really objective comparable data that is available. Just yesterday I was listening in on the plenary session uh, of the pre-summit on follow-up and review and with now the final hours of the pre-summit approaching we really need to think of how we will keep this momentum we had a great momentum over these three days and we're working towards September but of course also beyond September so we've seen incredible solution clusters and coalitions being presented business declarations being signed but how will we measure action 
a national embedding and delivering solutions on a national level is really key. And that pointed out during yesterday's plenary session. So we're really calling upon all the participants today to, to step up and, and make sure that we can come together and, and realize national accountability mechanisms. Because we have, as Will said, many learnings that we would love to share and, 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 and we would love to um, guide uh, others as well. But we need local organizations with the necessary local knowledge to make local national food systems indexes into a success. So come on board and let's build such an index for your country, because only if we are measuring the right metrics will we get the action we need. Will, back to you. Thanks, Victoria. Great stuff and, and, and really, really great summing up there at the end. Um, I think we've, we've lost the slide for a second, so hopefully that'll come back up in, in a minute. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit very briefly about the Plating Up Progress work. Um, I think the slide's coming up. Here we go. You should all be seeing, seeing the slide. So jump to the next slide if, if you get a chance, Chloe. That would be really helpful. Thanks. Um, so Plating Up Progress. Yeah, so we're, we're, Plating Up Progress is like a mini WBA in, in the UK, if you like. So we, we've got underlying metrics that, are, that we've worked together with Victoria's team to make sure that we're, we're asking the same things of, of companies. Um, and we're, we're interested in this, you know, health and nutrition, environment and social issues, these three pillars that, that it, this is a really common, strong framework that we've got across both pieces of work. Um, and because we don't, we don't think this needs to be, you know, prescriptive in terms of how you present the results of, of benchmarks, we've actually combined this work in, in, in the UK into 10 core topics uh, that we assess the companies on. Um, but the, the important bit is that the underlying indicators and metrics are, are, are really common with, with the work that Victoria's team are doing. Um, and we, we, we look at a smaller scope of, com of companies. So we're looking prim primarily at the consumer facing companies in the UK. So the supermarkets, restaurant chains, caterers and some of the wholesalers. Uh, we're not looking at the growers and producers and the manufacturers. Um, to be honest, for scope reasons, because we're really at the Food Foundation, we're really interested in healthy and sustainable diets. So we have a reduced scope in terms of the number of co companies and a slightly different scope in terms of where, the, the sectors in the value chain we look at. But again, you know, just to sort of overemphasize it a little bit, the important thing is that we're using the same underlying metrics. Um, and, and that's how we make sure that we get some consistency. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the results of Plating Up Progress. We've been doing it for a couple of years. Uh, we have seen companies make progress. Um, so what, but I, what I think is really important, next slide, please, Chloe, is that what I think is really important is the engagement piece. You know, it, we, we've got the methodologies. Um, what a toolkit needs to do is to help us work out how to engage with the right stakeholders as well. So in the UK, we engage with three core stakeholders for our Plating Up Progress work, the businesses, the investors and the government. Uh, we haven't got the government here today. Uh, they, they're, apparently they're quite busy, um, but we do have the other two. So we're gonna jump into a, a short session, uh, a panel style Q and A session with um, Sophie Lawrence, who is senior ethical, sustainable and impact researcher at Rathbone Green Bank Investments. We do, we engage quite a lot with, um, uh, Sophie's team on the, the results of our dashboard at Plating Up Progress and Julie Oust, who is Head of Sustainability and Change at Bidfood UK. Um, for those who aren't based in the UK, Bidfood is uh, one of the biggest wholesalers in the UK. So they, they supply directly to a lot of caterers and restaurants and those sort of uh, consumer facing um, companies. Um, Sophie, Julie, thanks so much for joining us. Nice to see you again. Um, Really great to have you here. I'm going to fire a few questions off at you, if that's OK. Um, Sophie, I'll, I'll start with you. So for, from an investor's perspective, what, why are the national benchmarks like, like the work we do at Plating Up Progress, why, why are they useful for, for people like yourselves and the work you do? 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Will. And and just quickly first, just for those who haven't heard of us before, um, and also thank you for inviting me to speak today as well. It's great to see this collaboration come to life. Um, but Green Bank is um, the dedicated ethical, sustainable and impact investment arm of Rathbones. Um, and really over the last 20 years, we have been managing bespoke portfolios um, for our clients that really try to deliver strong long term financial returns, but also have this positive uh, benefit for people and planet. And that's really, I, I think, key to, to this conversation. Um, because in order to do that, we really need to understand some of the kind of economic transformations that are underway that link to sustainable development. And that's really what drives all our investment decisions and, and the research that we do at Green Bank. Um, so I think that's important context. I think, you know, thinking about specifically about the food system, you know, we, we, we see it as a major driver of climate change and biodiversity loss. You, at the same time, you've also got social issues. So you've got the incidence of, of overweight and obese, um, obesity and, and it, has been a real key risk factor in case of severe COVID. Um, you've also got kind of labor rights um, in, in global food chains. So you've got a lot of different sustainability challenges. Um, and I think to be able to understand those um, well, you need to really understand uh, what uh, companies are doing in all those areas. Um, and I think one of the things that's going to be really challenging about looking at the whole food system is because of all those different issues that are coming in, you need to have some consistent way of, of, of looking at them. Um, so I won't kind of go into the semantics of our, our kind of research process, but I think really when we're, we're trying to understand those kind of risks and opportunities, we've got to gather consistent information across different companies. Um, and that really allows us to see, you know, who are the leaders, who are the laggards, um, and, and also try to kind of quantify some of those, those risks and opportunities more effectively. Um, so that's really where, where this comes in. And I think when we're looking at this um, kind of the, the role that companies are playing in, in, in building a healthy and just and sustainable food system, which is really what we're talking about today, there is currently a real lack of kind of consistent, high quality, meaningful data um, that we can look at um, as investors. And we're often kind of comparing apples to oranges. Um, and that's where, you know, this benchmark, but also the work that's already been done by, by yourselves, Will, the Plating Up Progress, but also Access to Nutrition Initiative and World Benchmarking Alliance um, benchmarks come in. Um, and really, as an investor, I guess these, these kind of give us really high quality analysis that complement that broader assessment. Um, and we have an, a, an ability to then compare um, different companies um, against each other. Um, so they're, they're really valuable um, and anything we can be doing to kind of build on that and incre increase that consistency and also the uptake. And I think that's just the, the final point I'll kind of end on, if, if, if I may, which is to say, it's great that we can have that benchmark, but it's also really important that we actually have companies reporting in line uh, with the issues that we're trying to include. Um, and so that's why we really also are calling for um, extending the mandatory reporting requirements um, to cover a broader range of topic areas. And that's something that shouldn't just apply to the UK, but if we can get that globally as well, that would be, be really, really um, valuable. Um, and actually last week we called on, a, um, we. Uh, led a group of investors to call on the UK government to de demonstrate really strong leadership in this area following the food strategies um, recommendations. So I'll kind of pause there, but but really, um, yeah, strongly behind uh, greater consistency um, and also that kind of mandatory piece is important as well to us. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned the, the, the mandatory reporting at, at the end. Um, just for context, for those of you who... who, who um, don't live in the the bubble that is the U, the UK. Um, in the in the last couple of weeks, the, the the first national food strategy report for 75 years has been produced um, for for England rather than the UK as a whole. Um, and within that, there was a strong recommendation that the government make it mandatory for food businesses over a certain size to report on sales of healthy and sustainable food. And I won't go into the nuts and bolts of what that what that meant, but um, so Sophie did a really good job with a coalition of investors of actually putting together a co-signed letter to the Prime Minister uh, supporting um, not just the mandatory reporting recommendation, but also that the government may take a, a more ambitious stance when it comes to uh, facilitating change in, in, in the food system and, and the role it, it has in terms of regulation and incentive for business change, um, which is a, a quite a nice way of, of a sort of uh, illustrating that real, one of the really important parts here is, is stakeholder engagement and 
people often think traditionally that business uh, that investors engage with the businesses that they've got uh, money invested in but actually there's a really powerful lever there for for multi-stakeholder engagement and if and if the finance sector and investors can engage with governments on creating change then it, it in a way it's sort of one of the maybe slightly underused levers that we've got um and and so sophie i guess what you're saying is consistent data put in a digestible format which is kind of what a benchmark is if we want to sort of break it down is is like the bedrock of information that you need to be able to do that sort of thing is that is that kind of way what, what you mean by that yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it's important as well um, to remember that we're we're kind of grappling with a lot of big system uh, transformations that are underway at the moment. So we've got the kind of all the work that we're talking about here with the food system, but that's also happening in healthcare and transport and energy and, and climate. So um, and beyond, you know, those are just a few examples. So I think anything that we can do to, to build um, kind of consistent kind of data sets that are, are, are encompassing some of those those really big kind of system challenges is is really useful um uh, to investors um and actually that brings me nicely to to sort of i guess you know we've consistent data mandatory data i guess the third piece that that we really are calling for and i know this is consistent and and, and this coalition um, is a really good example of that is greater collaboration on this issue as well i think we'll all recognize the the scale of the challenge that's ahead of us and and i think we do need to make sure that we are um you know collaborating wherever we can um you mentioned the kind of investors government business um that's definitely something that that we really take uh, seriously as well and just making sure that um you know different efforts are joined up in the solutions um so i think this is a great example of, of that with the world benchmark alliance and the food foundation um coming together on this um but that's something we definitely need to think about going forward as well great thanks sophie yeah collaboration is key isn't it none of us not, none of us have individually got the answers um thanks so much um Ju julie I'd, i'll bring you in at this point i think um so you, you represent the business world in this uh, session um, in its entirety, um, but, but more specifically, um, if, if just for those people who don't know much about bid food and, and, and bid core on a global level, if you could give a, a very quick introduction into that for context. Um, and also, you know, I'm really interested in how, how do companies like yourselves react to these benchmarks? Are they, are they a good thing? Are they a bad thing? Are they, are they just something you've got to tolerate? I mean, how, how does it actually work from, from your perspective? Hi, hello, everyone. Um, well, first, I just want to thank you for being on, letting me come on this call, because I'm just so keen to see progress in this area, and I'm a huge fan of benchmarking. Uh, so to answer your question, I'm uh, the Head of Sustainability and Change for Bid Food UK, which is part of Bid Core. So Bid Core have loads of different food service businesses across the world, and I am in the, obviously, in the UK, the UK market is dominated by two big players and we are the two um, wholesalers that the Food Foundation chose to benchmark. So um, I understand that the scope is, the planned scope is going to be wider, but the starting point is just comparing the two biggest players that dominate the market. I'm right in saying that? Yeah, correct. Um, I, I, it's just been such a really good experience. Uh, I. First of all, because of, we have real clarity because it gives us a framework to work to, to spell out what good looks like. It means that we just can't be selective or ignorant on what we need to do. And only yesterday I had a customer call me and say, I really need to get my head around sustainability. What do, we, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to be more sustainable? And I said, well, here we are. There's a framework immediately that I can give you to show you what you should be working on. So having clarity on what good looks like is a really good start. It also, I would say, addresses complacency. Uh, I would say some parts of the business were quite shocked that we scored a couple of red ratings and we hadn't got a green rating. Um, I think there was a subjective perception that we were doing more than we actually are in some areas. So the benchmark gives us an objective evaluation. Um, and also it shows that what perhaps passed as good maybe two years ago doesn't wash anymore. The bar is getting higher. And depending on how long you've been in the industry, I think it's a real practical demonstration that the, the bar is getting higher in terms of what good looks like. Um, also, it's pushed us to communicate more because the information that the benchmark is based on is just purely information in the public domain. And it's interesting because a couple of the areas where we scored a red are areas where we're actually doing a lot more than we have communicated about. So it's pushing us to say, look, we should be talking about stuff that we're doing because it, it's it's 
it's unjustifiably a red because we haven't talked about it. So it's pushing us to uh, communicate more externally and then also internally to kind of educate our sales teams on what we are doing so that we can talk to our customers about what we're doing. And then finally, I think a real, um, something I could not necessarily have predicted, but I think we're all very human um, and we do tend to lean on our own expertise in our work. So I've noticed, you know, it's easy for a lot of customers and to, to lean on working on plastics because not only is it a big area to work on, but it's something that everyone really understands. It's easy to get your head around, whereas it's harder to get your head around biodiversity and more complicated topics because I think sustainability can be baffling for a lot of people. So it's it remains to reflect that I have often lent on my areas of greater knowledge because that's kind of my comfort zone and it's forcing me to understand more about the issues that I know less about so it brings a kind of rigor and robustness if you like to um, a company's strategy I think not that there isn't room to make progress and hopefully we'll have time to talk about that but basically it's been a really really good experience for us to be benchmarked. Great, thanks, Julie. And I, I promised uh, no money exchange hands between me and Julie for her to say what a great experience it was to be benchmarked. Um, but 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 it, it, I mean, it is it is really encouraging to see that response from businesses as well. Um, and I think you touched on on something there that I think is really important is working out what good looks like and how businesses should be communicating it is is it is at the core of all of this, really, isn't it? Um, and and the point about things that you may be doing internally, but you're not communicating. Um, again, it, we, we deliberately take a position in Plating of Progress that it's in the public domain or it doesn't count, um, because that, that's what accountability looks like as far as, as, far as we're concerned. Um, and if, if we can flush that out a little bit more over time, I think that, that that's, that's progress, really. Um, I'm interested in in how you, how the national and the global context can um, can can connect up properly, and we've got a couple of minutes before before we move on to the next session. So this is for both of you, really. Just any thoughts on how how this toolkit can make sure that you know, for example, Julie, in your situation, you focus on on bid food in the UK, but you're part of Bidcore globally. Um, how do we make sure that Bidcore is being held accountable? But at the same sense, so are you operationally in, in bid food in the UK and your colleagues in the other countries that bid cooperate. Um, how do we join all that up together? And is, is, is that valuable for you as a company as well? Um, and, and similarly for, for Sophie, obviously, Platinum Progress looks at 30 companies. You may only have an interest in 15 of those or maybe fewer. Um, how do we make sure that companies in different countries that you, you may have holdings in are, get, are getting covered? Um, so just just an open question for both of you. We've, we've got a couple of minutes left, if, if that's OK. I can start by saying um, I think standards, from my perspective, standards and rigour in qualities of reporting are really variable country to country. So our headquarters are in South Africa and we've had conversations about our national reporting and even on something as fundamental as CO2, and water consumption, the quality and the accuracy of reporting is really, really variable. So I think that's quite a challenge because I'm told anecdotally that the UK is kind of leading the way in terms of the accuracy and the rigor applied to reporting. So uh, that I'd be interested in feedback on that, but I, I, it's certainly a challenge just, just to report CO2 as a level playing field across the, our business. Yeah, I would, I would echo that as well. And I think uh, something that I think we need to maintain as part of this this conversation is the benchmark is is great but we also need to drive that better data disclosure more generally on this topic so that it's not just the benchmark companies where we're seeing that really big jump up in data disclosure um, but we're actually driving um, better dis data disclosure for all companies um, on, the, on the types of issues that they should be reporting and I think Julie mentioning climate or, or carbon you know we, maybe we can't say climate even because there's um, you know a range of, of reporting there but I think we we've kind a long way with 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 certain aspects of climate reporting um, and I think we really need to kind of accelerate that for some of the other issues especially on the social side that we've seen this really you know quite slow evolution actually although we've got to a good place it's taken a long time and we need to do that much more quickly 
um, to make sure that, that that this kind of data is is integrated and it's 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 you know it's being fed into actual real decisions that people are making, um, and it's not that kind of blind spot. Um, so yeah, benchmarks great, but we also need to think about driving that wider data disclosure. Yeah, really good points, both of you. Thank you, thank you. I guess what, you've given me a, quite a nice segue into the next section. So in, in a way, what we're saying is you've got the big global companies that may, may be reporting on some things. You've got, their, you've got the, the national big fish, if you like, that, that may be reporting as well. And then there's probably quite a long tail of smaller companies that don't get covered by benchmarks because they're not, there aren't enough hours in the day for us to cover those benchmarks. So one thing that, that, that may be useful is, is what can this toolkit do to allow some kind of self-reporting or, or a framework for, for the SMEs that will never make it onto the big benchmarks just because of their size, for them to actually um, use the same metrics and, and kind of report in, in a similar way, um, which, which is, kind of some of the questions we've got about this um this toolkit and how we make it work internationally so julie sophie th thanks so much for joining us i really appreciate it and i know we'll, we'll have many more of these kind of conversations um i'm going to move on to the the second part of the, the the sort of panel discussion section now if that's okay um and we're, we're really privileged to have uh, joining us uh, from three different countries to to discuss the the ins and outs and the nuances and what we might look look at in terms of benchmarking in different countries. Um, uh, Dr. Habiba Hassan Wasef, who has spent many years working in really important roles at the World Health Organization um, and is a trustee of the African Nutrition Society. Um, Habib is joining us from from Egypt um, and has got a particular focus on on uh, food outcomes in Africa. Um, Felipe Amanta joins us from the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies in Indonesia. Um, the Center for in Indonesian Policy Studies are already an ally in the World Benchmarking Alliance. So it's fantastic to have uh, a fully, fully signed up ally of WBA's uh, joining us today. And Fazana Khan, who is from Sri Lanka and was responsible for setting up the Regional Sun Business Network in Sri Lanka. For those who, who don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, for those who don't know about the Sun Network, Sun stands for Scaling Up Nutrition, um, works very closely with the industry in terms of making progress in, in, in terms of nutritional outcomes. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate you, you, you giving us your, your time and your insights into this. Um, People like yourselves are the kind of people who are going to help us to get this toolkit right. So it's, it's important that, that you, you, you were able to join us today. So thanks for that. Um, just for context, we know that nutrition, environment and social issues persist virtually everywhere. They're global and they're national issues. Um, so I'm just going to start, start this off really, uh, Fazana, just interested in what your views in terms of to what extent would, would holding the food industry uh, to account in Sri Lanka be a useful exercise. Are there, are there any particular sectors that we should look at? Are there any particular issues that are, are the kind of the must-have priority issues? You know, what's the context for that in Sri Lanka? Yes, uh, thanks, Will, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, really glad to be here. Um, yes, in Sri Lanka, I would say uh, we would need to focus more on the SME sector. Uh, because SMEs constitute about 70% of uh, um, the businesses and the more larger organizations have some form of uh, sort of systems. I would say they all have the good manufacturing practices or ISO, ISO 22000 and such certifications. But it is the SMEs that don't seem to have any form of benchmarking. And, uh, you know, if you look at our nutrition indicators, three out of four deaths in Sri Lanka is due to an uncommunicable disease. And uh, we need a lot of regulations coming into the SMEs in terms of their formulations of sugar, salt, fat constitutions, and so on. So I feel if you do some benchmarking and, you know, create it as an advocacy platform and work together with uh, other coalitions such, such as the UN networks and even uh, the Sun Business Network, uh, we can, you know, uh, drive this to a great extent because um, as of late, Sri Lanka has developed the front of pack labeling, the traffic light system, and they're looking at uh, uh, 
uh, sort of uh, regulating advertisements which are targeted at pregnant women and uh, young kids. So these are all in the cards and they do have some form of regulations for schools not selling unhealthy products, but uh, see these are not enforced all the time. And most of these sectors are supplied by the small and medium scale sectors. The large organizations are mostly conglomerates which export which meet certain standards or the multinationals the large uh, global companies which are present so they follow certain strict uh, standards which are global standards so i feel uh, to answer your question will we really have to focus on the sme sector yeah thanks fasana that's super interesting isn't it because it's in a way it's the opposite approach we took in plating of progress in the uk where we the, a lot of the food that people buy is do, it's dominated by big supermarkets and, and the big restaurant chains and, and so on. So we focused on them. Um, but actually, the, lever, the, lever, the levers for change in, in Sri Lanka might look really different. And the toolkit needs to, I guess what you're saying is the toolkit needs to um, take that into account and actually have something sensible to say as a guideline for doing that. Just to add, there are real, the challenge is most of these sectors are informal, right? So mm -hmm. we have to have a methodology to f find out where they are because they are in a unregistered boutique, home-based sort of very informal sector as well. That's the challenge. Yeah. That is a challenge, absolutely. Um, so, so the good news, Fosano, is we know you now, so we can we can mm -hmm. ask you loads of questions about this as we move forward in the in. in in putting together the toolkit. Um, and I think it's a super impo important point about the SMEs. Um, Habibu, if it's okay, I'll, I'll jump over to you um, at this point. So looking at Egypt and, and maybe in the wider context, Africa, um, you know, we, we have these headline issues that we look at uh, of, of nutrition, environment, and social inclusion. How well does that fit into the needs um, in, in, for example, Egypt in terms of, um, holding the food industry to account and what would a toolkit need to include to actually be relevant and, and useful as a tool as a as a something to, to benchmark the industry and track change uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for the question uh, i would like first to comment that in uh, what you call the least and developing uh, and uh, sorry the low and middle income countries or developing countries. It's important when you do an exercise like this that you have, you work through the government, unfortunately. It's not NGOs or any other partners. So uh, what you have uh, in, uh, what, in building the case for applying and use of the toolkit for monitoring and assessing the food industry may be very welcome but it is more welcome if you have the umbrella of the government. So that, that's uh, one issue. Then uh, I would like in the uh, indicators, some of the indicators I have looked up, uh, the indicators may need what I would call formulation of language because the human rights indicators, the way they are written, and I, this is an important strategic advice for this initiative. The way they are in, uh, uh, formulated trigger a reaction of political sensitivity in developing countries, in many developing countries, and maybe irritation. While our whole exercise is concerned with fundamental human rights and not political human rights. So I would like the formulation, I will not take the time now, but I have formulated all the human rights indicators exactly the same meaning in another manner that does not irritate governments in developing countries. That is one thing. Then the important, uh, important I think for us, not having already identified what is our food system like? What is the profile of our food system? So it is recommended that all the developing countries do the ident uh, profiling of the food system using the food system dashboard, which was introduced on occasion of the UN Food System Summit. 
And then you would know exactly who are the big actors, who are the small actors, what type of agriculture, all the information is there. And it would be, it's a great help and asset to the toolkit. Uh, another thing is the uh, ultimate and final objective is healthy food for all. Now I can't have healthy food for all in developing countries if I don't have a good social protection system, good coverage and poverty alleviation programs. So that they go hand in hand. I mean, if I only focus on the toolkit and leave all the others, I will not achieve my overall objective. So now who are the stakeholders? There are many stakeholders. Some of them are public, some of them are private. Some of them have what I would call a standardization, inspection and control authority. And these are of interest and they would be very much interest in the toolkit. So that is identification of the potential stakeholders is important. Uh, my colleague, my earlier colleague before, who spoke before me uh, mentioned small actors that is terribly important in our countries because we don't even have the big fish as you call them. We have transnational food industry implanted in our countries and the national big fish, the national SMEs and the very small actors. So we need to cover all of them. And We have in the industry, we have also all kinds of supply chains and retail systems. It's not only small actors in food production, but in the retail system and in the supply chains. We have hybrid supply chains. We have regular supply chains. We have controlled and uncontrolled. It's very, very, uh, very uh, different. Now, I would like here to benefit and build on indicators that country, Egypt, as well as all African countries are committed to. And this is, are the indicators of the biennial review of the commitment of heads of state to the 2014 Malibu Declaration for Investment in Agriculture and Agricultural Transformation. We have seven pillars that include social, include labor, include trade, include industry, include everything. And my suggestion is that once we have the toolkit, you negotiate with the African Union Commission and those responsible for the technical instrument and, and toolkit for the biennial review to introduce the elements and indicators of for monitoring and assessing food industry. I think they would be very, very happy because they don't have that content. That's one thing. Then the other thing that we can build on in Africa is the uh, Sun Initiative, which is scaling up nutrition, which covers practically all African countries. They have a stakeholder group that are committed to improvement of mother and child nutrition. And that is an excellent nucleus in Africa for you to work with. They're already committed to healthy and safe diets for mothers and children and all Africans. Another implementation agency or a program is the Food Environment Regional Network. It's a global network and it has now uh, is being established in Africa since a few uh, years. And the industry and the retail system and all the details, the indicators you have are very much are common between both of you. So they could be even an implementation arm for you in, in Africa, together with the Federation of African Nutrition Societies, which covers the whole continent. So I think uh, we have a great opportunity for introduction and acceptance of the initiative of using the toolkit for assessing, monitoring and assessing industry 
in Africa and not only in Egypt. Thank you. Habiba, thanks so much. I've been frantically scribbling things down on my notepad and we'll come back to you on this because I think, I think we've got an awful lot to learn in terms of how we do this. So thank you so much. Uh, Philippa, hi. Um, so Philippa, from, from, from Indonesia's perspective, um, how might benchmarking the major food industries across, across these issues help to create change? Again, given, given your background at the Centre for Indonesian Policy Studies, who, who are the main audience in Indonesia for this? Uh, who are the stakeholders that, that actually need to be paying attention to benchmarks like this? Sure, thank you so much, Will, and thanks for the opportunity to join this very important dialogue. I think this type of benchmarking and toolkit will be very essential in countries like Indonesia, especially as from our observation in Indonesia here, concerns like child labor in the supply chain and harmful environmental practices and unfair practices and partnerships with local communities, poor labor practices, and especially and importantly also lack of attention on nutrition for consumers are still plaguing the industry. So having this kind of benchmark are necessary and, and a huge momentum forward since the, the awareness of sustainability among Indonesian private sector companies are just emerging. So having these types will move from awareness into actionable items. Um, and I think on, on the second point on um, the key audiences, um, I think I completely agree with what Dr. Habiba have mentioned earlier about the importance uh, of engaging with policymakers um, here in Indonesia, where food and agriculture are undoubtedly political because given its importance for 30 million livelihoods of smallholder farmers and um, 270 million people uh, having to be fed with nutritious food. I think the government and the private sector, however, at the moment can still be quite siloed with governments and private sectors having each their own separate programs and having each of their own separate agendas to address sustainable development goals. So having this benchmarking and the same shared targets and goals um, are important so that national and local policies can actually embrace partnerships with private sectors and at the same time also keep private sector um, into account. So we should aim definitely to get these sustainable indicators and data to inform policy making. And, and we've heard from um, Arzana and Habiba about uh, SMEs and I'd like to add to that. I think the, the onus of responsibility is not only benchmarking the in-country um, SMEs and smallholder farmers, but also the, the responsibility falls on the global companies that engage in um, value chain across developing countries and to expand the scope of this exercise. So when they're doing a benchmarking in countries in the UK or in other de um, developed countries, um, I really hope that this benchmark and toolkit will encourage those companies to benchmark not only their practices in their country, but also across their supply chain with their suppliers, with the smallholder farmers, they're uh, working with processing facilities, um, outsourcing companies, et cetera, um, elsewhere. And I think last but not least, I, I would also add um, the importance of engaging with civil society actors, community organizers, or even journalists maybe. And this is for two ways. The first one, they would be an important accountability partner that will create the pressure and push companies to actually want to participate or feel the need to participate in such benchmarking processes. But also on the, on the second, importantly, um, these community organizers, local perspectives can be the local experts to inform how can the private sector actually reach the targets outlined in that benchmarking because as, as we heard earlier in the first um, panel, I think the indicators at the moment are still quite broad, understandably so, given it's a, a global benchmark. So having local community perspectives to actually inform how those indicators can manifest itself into actionable contextualized targets for private sector companies are important. This will help us understand better, okay, what does indicators on nutrition mean to Indonesia, who is currently suffering from a 30% stunting rate, for example. Um, do we focus on stunting, anemia, all of them? How does we actually how can we actually go about doing it? As well as the other indicators, um, social responsibility, labor, environmental sustainability, into really actionable targets. So having mm -hmm. um, civil society would be essential as well. 
Thank you so much, Philippa. Um, so much stuff there to unpack. And I'm not even going to do any of it justice um, in trying to do that. But we are we are um, recording this, so we're going to be able to sift through it and actually pull out these points. Um, and what I hope we'll do is put them together as a sort of a summary that we can share with everyone. Um, the, we, the, the, these sessions in the pre-summit are only 50 minutes long, which is mad. Um, and I've just hit the 50 minute mark. So if we can get the last two slides on, because this is the call to action, everyone pay attention, no one's allowed to leave. Um, as you can see, this is complex and we, it needs lots of uh, expert input and it needs collaboration. And that's why we are setting up this coalition. Um, so here's the timeline for it. Um, we, we want to have a first meeting in September just to talk about this in more detail and map out what, uh, what we want to achieve. Um, we'll be writing the first edition of the toolkit that's between ourselves at the Food Foundation and, and WBA between October and December. And we want the, the coalition to act as a, a review group on that to help us get it right. And we, it won't be perfect from day one, but we need to get we need to be pushing in the right direction. And then we want to be testing it out next year. So one more slide. And thank you for your patience. Um, what does this involve? So benefits of this is my sales pitch the benefits of joining the coalition okay you can be be part of an advisory group that develops a shared approach to benchmarking the food industry which is, i think as we all appreciate this is really important now the industry has got to change and if we can do it in the right way then we, we can we can make a lot of progress so the, the tasks involved in this are three meetings between september and november to review the toolkit and provide feedback on how it can be improved a final review session towards the end of the year You'd be joining a coalition of members who are already include, obviously, the Food Foundation and the World Benchmarking Alliance, but also Access Nutrition Initiative and Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, otherwise known as Apne and Gain, who've been with us all the way on this and helping us to, to shape this. So it's, it's a good group to be part of, and we need more people to help us get it right. What's in it for you? OK, so we want regional and national focus here. We don't necessarily need more global viewpoints. We, we've got that covered, but we want to work with organisations who will be able to trial the methodology on the ground in their own countries um, and help develop the toolkit towards that end. Um, on the ground is the key thing. You know, if you're going to engage with all these different stakeholders that, that we've all been talking about today, someone's got to be on the ground doing it. And we think that's going to be uh, super important. So we want people to join us. Uh, it's 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 a great opportunity, I think, for us to collectively make a difference. If you want to be part of it, you want to hear more, please do email Chloe. Um, if you've got a chance, Chloe, to put your email address in the chat so anyone can copy and paste it if it's uh, hard to cut and paste from a screen share. Uh, Chloe.McKean at foodfoundation.org.uk. Thank you ever so much for everyone who helped us put this together at WBA, Atney and Gain. Thank you so, so much to Victoria, to Julie, to Sophie, to Philippa, Fazana and Habiba for giving us your, your expert input. Hope it's been interesting. <clears throat> Do come with us on the journey. Um, I've overrun. Apologies for that. I owe you for next time. Thanks ever so much.